Good afternoon, everybody. Today, I wanted to talk to you about a concept that I've been running into recently concerning WebSocket APIs. Now, to get into it, essentially, I'm of the belief that baking a concept of a stream ID into your WebSocket API protocol is very important for the client-server interaction. Now, what I mean by a stream ID is essentially some concept that allows the server to communicate to the client the messages that are being sent to the client, which interaction they belong to. So as an example, imagine you connect to the Coinbase API and you ask the Coinbase API to send you pricing data on Bitcoin. Now, the Coinbase API is going to start sending you messages saying, hey, this is the price for Bitcoin. Now, what if you sent a request to the Coinbase API asking it to send you data on a coin that doesn't exist or a coin that's not supported by Coinbase? The Coinbase API, as it works today, will respond to that WebSocket message with an error message, essentially saying, sorry, that coin ID is not supported. However, what the Coinbase API does not do is communicate to you which request it is actually erroring on. So for example, if you sent a request to the Coinbase API saying, please send me Bitcoin, and then please send me made up coin ID, some random coin you make up. What the Coinbase API will actually send you back for the error is something that looks like this. Now you do have a reason field that says like, hey, a CRM USD is not a valid product. However, you don't see anything really else that ties back to the request that you made. So it's pretty difficult as the implementer of a client to handle that error. You don't really know what error errored out or what request errored out. Where did the problem happen? Was it Bitcoin that failed? Was it the other coin that failed? It's kind of hard to figure that out in your actual code. As a human, you can look at this error and be like, oh, okay, I understand what happened. However, it's hard to write the code to actually handle that problem. Now, one way to solve this problem that we just described is with some kind of ID field or state value or something to that effect. So here you can see an example of a message that you can actually send the Coinbase WebSocket API. You can subscribe, you can say, hey, I want Ethereum, USD, and Euros, and then some different channels that you care about. So one thing you could do so that we know if this specific message we're going to send the Coinbase API errors out is you could, if the Coinbase API supported it, is provide some kind of like state value. So imagine we added a property called state and we gave it a value of ABC and then the Coinbase API sends us an error. What they would do in this implementation is send us back that exact state value we sent them. So the reason you would do that is because I send this state value to the API with a message, with the rest of the message, and then they send me back the data that satisfies that request. And they send me back the value that I gave them so that I'm able to wire that together or know, hey, this error actually references back to the message I sent them. That's one way you could approach it, and that's one way I've seen these kind of things approached. Um, another way to do it is you could do an ID. So you could just do an ID and ID zero or ID one, et cetera. And then the server would send you back the same ID you sent them. So you know what relates to what. Now, the reason I'm bringing this up is because this is actually baked into a new protocol or a newer protocol. It's been around for a couple of years, but a newer protocol called RSocket. RSocket actually has the ID baked into its protocol. So every message that happens between an RSocket server and an RSocket client includes these stream IDs. Now, before we go any further, I want to talk briefly about the interaction models that belong or exist within RSocket. So the one that's probably most familiar to you is request response. And request response is very familiar to people that work in HTTP. In HTTP, you send a request to the server and the server sends you back a response that includes some body data, headers, that kind of thing. So in our socket, you can send a request response request to the server and the server is going to process that request and send you back a reply. Now in that reply or that response, there will include a stream ID and the message that you sent the server 
includes the same stream ID that the server is going to send back to you. Now, as a user of our socket, you don't have to write any of that. The protocol implementation is going to do all of that for you. Now, the next model that would probably be pretty familiar to you, and which is very familiar to this model here, where we kind of just get messages back from a WebSocket, is request stream. Now, in request stream, you send a request to a server, and the server is going to stream back to you responses to that request. Now, when you send that message to the server, the protocol implementation is going to include a stream ID with that request. And the server, every time it sends you a message, is going to include that stream ID in that message. Now, that allows you to actually wire together, or more so, it allows the protocol implementation to wire together all of the responses that are coming from the server into a nice API that can be worked with on your client. So if we take a moment and we look at an implementation that I'm actually using currently in uh, React.js to talk to a uh, RSocket API to consume Coinbase data is we can have an RSocket instance, we make a request stream, and we can see here that we provide it a object with a couple methods on it. Now we can see that we have an on error, we have an on next, and we have an on complete. So what this shows us is that I'm going to send a request to the server. The server is going to respond with payloads, essentially, data that satisfies my request. So in my example, it's Bitcoin data or Ethereum data or whichever product on Coinbase that I happen to ask the server to tell me about. It's going to send back that data to me, and it's just going to stream over and over and over. Every time there's new data, it sends it to me. And then if for some reason there is an error, I'm going to have my error callback called. Now, this is really important because it is much different than the WebSocket example we saw. In the WebSocket example, there's just messages. You just get messages. You don't know if they're error messages. You don't know if they're payload messages. You have no concept of any framing around the message other than, hey, the server sent you some data. Good luck. Try to, try to figure out what the server is trying to tell you. However, in our socket, we see that we have a stream ID included, which each response from the server, and that allows us to actually say, hey, that error message that I just received on my client belongs to this particular call that happened right here. So if I was to call this block of code twice, each one of those requests that go up to the server would include different stream IDs. So if one of those streams has an error, the protocol implementation is actually able to notify the correct code which error happened and how that should be handled. Okay, so that's going to be all for today. I hope that you learned something about WebSocket APIs, and hopefully I convinced you that including some kind of stream ID or state or some kind of identifier support in your WebSocket APIs is important. And additionally, Hopefully I piqued your interest about RSocket. And if I did and you'd like to learn more, you can head over to rsocket.io where you can find the documentation, uh, the whole protocol spec, etc. Feel free to reach out to me on my socials and let me know what you think.